Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski, who is playing with her computer angles and her very professional setup. Um, And today I am very excited to be joined by John Bassoff. John is the author of nine novels, including the most recently published Beneath Dark Waters, which is what we will be mostly discussing today. So welcome, John. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And it's Beneath Cruel Waters. Oh, but I miss. That's fine. Wow, that's terrible of me. I can't even get the, the book title right. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Beneath Pearl Waters. Yes, we'll we'll edit that out or we'll fix that. Um, but my first question for you um, more generally is, when did you start writing? And also, did you always gravitate towards long form fiction or did you play around with different formats? You know, I, I started writing out when, when I was just a little guy, just doing short stories and so forth. And um, for whatever reason, I was always interested in kind of dark stuff and probably from the movies that my parents showed me when I was little. Um, and then I kind of gave it up through through high school and, and even in college, I didn't do a whole lot. And uh, after I graduated college, I, I read this book called uh, The Killer Inside Me by Jim oh, Thompson, yes. which uh, like totally, I had never read anything like it. It was written from the point of view of like a total deranged psychopath. And I was like, hey, this, this sounds good. I like this. <laughs> And so uh, after that, I decided, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to try to write a novel. And uh, I did. And it was it was really bad. It was just like a a total ripoff of Jim Thompson. But it kind of got me on on that direction of of writing novels. And and so since then, it's it's yeah, I've pretty much been a novelist. Um, I've written a short story here and then. But I but I feel more comfortable with the long form. Gotcha. And so what other, you know, did you feel like horror authors specifically impacted you along your journey? Or do you feel like it was more of a melange of all sorts of authors? And then, of course, since you write horror, those are kinds of the ones that you identify with. Yeah, it was a, it was a little bit of a mix. Um, you know, I think I think authors, as they as they try to imitate other authors, if you do it badly enough, you sometimes create your own voice, which is, I think, what happened with me. Um <laughs> So there was, you know, the early influence of Jim Thompson. And then I read a lot of like uh, Southern Gothic writers, uh, Flannery O'Connor, you know, William Faulkner and kind of the the big names in in Southern Gothic. And and they were a a heavy influence, Um, probably a little less with with horror. I mean, my books kind of straddle the line of of horror, a lot of them. Uh, But I've always been really interested in in, you know, sense of place and narrative style. So, um, yeah, I, th- I think my influences are, are pretty vast. Yeah. That's what my next question to you is, do you ever feel like you're pigeonholed into a genre, whether it be horror or thriller or sort of, you know, dark fiction, or do you feel like you have the freedom to explore that? And that's just sort of where your books naturally end up. I think, um, you know, the genre is, is more of a, a marketing tool of just kind yeah. of giving, giving readers an idea of what, the, of what they're getting into. I don't think that I really write in a particular genre. Um, yeah. I think this one beneath Crow waters, they put as thriller, which it's definitely doesn't feel like a thriller to me, but, uh, it has but it's elements, I suppose. Yeah, of a thriller, right? elements, yeah. It's, it's psychological. It's, it's suspenseful. Um, some of my other ones have, have, you know, they've put as horror. I'm not sure if they totally fit as horror either. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I would say everything that I write is dark and I'm okay with people saying that he writes dark fiction because right. that's definitely true. Um, and speaking of you know, fiction and your writing career, you're also a high school teacher. So I'm sure you get this question all the time, but how do you balance that with, you know, finding time to write? And do you feel like that ever impacts your motivation to write, you know, working with uh, more like structured writing um, for your day job? Yeah, I just, I just, uh, just do a really bad job of teaching. And, and, and when I'm trying to teach, I just tell the kids to shut up so I can write. Right. It's like right, uh, free, free read time or you yeah, know, exactly. whatever. No, I, I, um, I feel like teaching and, and writing, it's, it's been kind of a nice hand in hand job. I think, you know, I get a lot of, I get a big kick out of, out of teaching my own students creative writing. And, and I think being a novelist and being a published novelist gives me a, a little bit of credibility. I mean, it's, it's high schoolers, so you can only earn so much, but it gives me a little bit. And, and so it's fun to see, I've had some students come back years later, um, you know, saying they're still writing or oh, doing awesome. some, some self-publishing and that kind of stuff. And I, that's always, that's always a lot of fun, but you know, with teaching too, we get the, we get summers off, which, which helps as a writer. So I'm able to use that time. Um, 
but yeah, like, like balancing time as, as a writer. And I think any full-time job you have is, is a challenge. You know, I don't have like a, a great routine or anything in my writing. It's just, it's just whenever I can, but you know, I think being a high school teacher and being able to teach writing and, and teach uh, fiction and so forth kind of adds a little bit to uh, the motivation to keep writing. I'm always fascinated too by like, you know, people who continue to teach and who love to read and write on their own. And how have you seen like the love of literature or lack thereof evolve throughout, you know, as kids are becoming, you know, more, you know, the kids these days, more and more attached to their phones, more, less and less inclined to read. Like, how have you seen that evolved and how do you keep up the sort of, you know, freshness and excitement of reading for kids who are less and less inclined to do so? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely depends on the class. It depends on what kids you're teaching for that particular year. But um, it, it's certainly more of a challenge, to, especially trying to get students to read an entire novel. You know, to, to keep the attention for, for that long is, is tricky. Um, I, I think what I've realized over, over time is, um, you know, maybe, maybe the district shouldn't hear this, but I've, I've always felt <laughs> like if, if you can teach what you love and what you you feel passionate about more so right. than just what the the set curriculum is, um, yes. the kids are are going to respond in some way. And, and I've tried to balance it of of giving them choice in, in what they read and 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 then you know assigning them certain stuff. I think I probably do more heavily on short stories just because uh-huh. of what I said as far as like the attention span and and will kids actually spend time reading on their own? Which usually the answer is no. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not depressed by it. I, there's there's still a lot of kids who who do love reading and and um, who are passionate about it. And and the ones who aren't, it's it's fun to at least get a little bit of spark occasionally from them. Right. Do you feel like it? You're still continuing to teach the sort of standard classics, or as you know, the attention span and the difficulty to get kids to read continues. Do you feel like you want to allow the freedom of choice so much more? I feel like, I mean, I've always loved to read, but I see so many issues. Like I personally did not read some of the novels. I won't name them, but there were some novels that I was just like, why would I don't? This isn't interesting to me. And you could tell too that the teacher wasn't really passionate about it either. And I think that that's really important too. That's part partially why I mean, college is so exciting for a lot of people is because they finally, you know, can find a little more niche of their interest as well as the person teaching it is hopefully a little more interested. So I guess, you know, do you feel like the, you, you are able to put more of your own choices and passions into the curriculum or are you just having to navigate ways to deal with the standard classics, like in a different way, I guess? Yeah, I I think I've tried balancing it as, as as best as I can. Um, I think, um, Kind of switching it up. Well, there there is some value, I think, in in the classics and having having a common text and, and and having that common language. But there's also a value in in kids being able to pick pick what they want to read. Right. Um, and there's disadvantages to both as well. You know, obviously, you're not going to find a book one book that everybody loves. That's impossible. And if you give everybody a choice, sometimes they're going to make terrible choices. So right. Um, so it's just it's it's been a balance and and. Um, you know, I've been, man, I've been teaching for, for more than 20 years and, and I would love to say that I've got it figured out, but I I definitely don't. I, every year I feel like I'm, I'm starting new, just like every novel you write, you're like, yeah, this, this one should be a little bit easier, but it never really is. And I think that's, I mean, I can imagine it's difficult because while the books might stay the same and like the text might stay the same, the kids who are learning them and the way that you have to teach them, that has to constantly change because 20 years ago, I mean, I just think like I, I'm a little younger than you. So I went to, when I went to high school, it was just sort of on the cusp of like, I was, I had an iPhone, but it wasn't like attached to it all the time. Yeah. The idea of like having laptops in class was still like pretty new. And now like do kids like still use pen and paper like I haven't been in a high school class in a long time do they take yeah. everything digital like is everything digital now it's almost, it's almost all digital it's I remember I was, well I was like um I don't know how long ago this was but it, it was I guess when when smartphones were, were just starting and I remember I was teaching and this girl had her phone out and I maybe it wasn't even a smartphone it's probably just like a flip phone or like a, a blackberry phone. or a sidekick yeah. or one of those yeah, where she yeah. could text somebody and I could not believe like I was 
indignant. How can you have your phone out in my class? Like, like I could not believe she did this. And then nowadays, every single kid has, it's just part of you. Every kid has their phone out all the time. And, and school, are they just like open about it? Like there's not, because at least yeah, when I was in high no, school, it was kind of like, if you have your phone out, they'll call you out. Like you're not, you had to be like secretive about it. Kids just now are openly just like on their phones. Yeah. There's not a lot of sneaking anymore. Um, Sad. so they, they do every, we give them all an iPad. Um, and so they, read all their books and do all their writing on the iPad. And an iPad is, you know, it's basically just like a big phone. Yeah. And so, um, and there was, again, there's a lot of cool things about it. Like we can access so many more books and, and texts right. on the, on the iPad. Um, but there's, you know, there's times I'll come over to, you know, work with them and they're writing and there's all these little text messages popping up on their iPad. Well, like <laughs> I, I, I don't know how they can focus at all, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's been the single biggest change in, in teaching over the last 10, 15 years, for sure. Is, yeah, the distractibility that. factor, because I, I think it's like, even when I had my laptop, I think it was like senior year of high school is when I kind of shifted to like bringing my laptop to school and having it be there. But I would still like take all my notes because I know that there's like studies that have said if you write it down, like on paper, that you retain it more. And I personally read everything on my Kindle just because I don't have the space. But I remember, too, it was like that feeling of getting handed out the books and you could see like who else had read it. It's like, let's all turn to this page. And it's so funny to think that like you really couldn't have any distractions then or if you had a phone, it was so obvious. And now it's like, how are you able to manage, you know, how are you able to manage the distractibility factor? Do you just kind of have to like let it slide and hope that like the kids who will pay attention will pay attention and there's only so much you can do. Like that's gotta be, a, but you're also a authority, authority figure and you got to have some yeah. discipline. Like how do you, how do you straddle that line? Yeah. It's picking your battles. That's what it comes down <laughs> to. I mean, there's, there's sometimes you're like, put your phones away or else I'm going to kill you. And then there's other times where you're just like, you know, and sometimes, you know, certain kids handle better than others. Uh, some kids will pull their phones out once they're all done with everything and they get their Which work. Which is, that's so fine. Cool. I mean, that's not as big a deal. Yeah. And then there's other kids who are just, who are just completely, it's, it's like a heroin addiction and, and you take it away yeah. from them for 30 seconds and they start going in withdrawal. So, um, yeah, if you figure something out, let me know. It's hard because I am like when I'm alone and when I'm bored, I, my screen time is disgusting. It could be like seven hours. And if you think about that, like, that is disgusting. I spent seven hours somehow on this little device that I somehow I wrote beneath cool waters, right. For every single other question, but I'm <laughs> sorry, I messed it up the title. Well. <laughs> um, but I think it's so it's, I'm always just fascinated by how, like, I've never really wanted to be a teacher, but I am fascinated by how the evolution of reading is continuing to be instilled in the next generation and the generation after that, because I always grew up like going to a restaurant, I would at least have like a book or like if I was at a party and I was a young kid, I would have a book. Like that would be my distraction. And now it's just like shove the screen in front of their face. And even if they are reading on that screen, it's still a screen. And so it's, it's very, I mean, I guess to add, well, I mean, we'll get into your book, but for it to end on a note of hope, perhaps, um, what are some of the most promising things that you've seen as you've continued to teach this, this next generation and seeing their love of literature continue to march on? I mean, I still have, I still have a lot of kids who are just incredibly creative. I, you, you teach those kids where you sometimes I'll compare myself of, of where I was in high school versus where they are now. And, and there's no, there's no comparison. They're just, they're way more mature than I was. And they're much better writers than I we was. We have the internet there. They have the internet. So you got that. And, and, um, so, you know, as we know, every generation looks back on the last one and, or, or right. looks back, looks at this one and says, oh, it's not as good as the way it used to be. Um, but there's some there really are some amazing kids. And and um, some of them, in spite of all the technology, some of them use the technology as as a tool. And so I haven't given up hope. I, I, th I think I think this generation still got a still got a lot to, to offer in the future. So maybe it's the one after that, that we really have to be the ones that are literally like being born with screens, like shoved in their faces. That's a little concerning, at least, you know, the ones that are 18 now, at least kind of were in that window. Sure. Uh, but yeah. yeah, it's scary. I mean, it's scary to think about in technology, that's like a whole, you know, horror story in itself, but it's, you know, you have to accept it too. You're not a Luddite and you're part, you know, you're a cool guy and you're, you know, you're hip with contemporary, you know, not even that, but it's just, I feel like it's like the teachers who are really older sometimes too, who are like, you know, they've been there so long that it's like, they're hesitant to change. I think you're adaptable to change, which is super important for teaching and for understanding like how best to communicate these important things that we have to learn. Yeah. I hope, I hope so. I hope so. 
I mean, if, if you're, I wish I had, could have had a teacher as cool as you, cause I gotta say, I didn't have really any cool high school teachers because it, it's that passion too. I think even though they might've, you know, been talking passionately about Charles Dickens or whatever, like great expectations is a fantastic book. I just personally, like I spoke about this on another podcast interview, but there was, I just will never forget. They gave us a test that was, you had to identify quotations from the book and who said them and when they were said. And I'm like, 14 years old. And I'm like, this is not really an approachable way to like understanding this really deep, rich text. So now I do think certain things like technology sometimes like can help a little bit in terms of like the understanding of older texts and helping make it more approachable. Yeah. Well, and I, I taught my daughter last year, she's in high school and she was in my class. So oh, that's if, you can, <laughs> if you can remind her that I'm a cool yes, teacher. Yes. I, I, really I, I mean, I would, and having a, I mean, was that awkward? I mean, having a writer as a dad too, especially like a writer of like a cool, you know, your books are cool and they're awesome. So. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was, it was not awkward having her in my class. She's not a reader. It's interesting. You know, oh, interesting. She, yeah. She's, she hates reading. Um, and she's, she's a good reader. She's a good writer, but she just doesn't like it. And, and you do realize as even more so as a parent than as a teacher, you can't force them, you know, you like, yeah, you, can, yeah. you can encourage them, but you know, the, when I try to force my daughter to read, that's, that's not going to happen. So, um, do you yeah. think she just hasn't found the right thing that she likes to read or she just has, you know, the art of reading is just like not something that's interested. I think she's just know. decided she doesn't like reading and, and hopefully, hopefully she'll, hopefully it's um, a phase. Yeah. Hopefully it's a phase. All right. Well, let's dive into, let's get underneath those, those cruel waters. Um, so where did the inspiration for this book specifically come about? How did you, cause you've written a lot of books. So where, you know, where did this one come from? So I, I had a friend who's, who's, who's his father actually had passed away and, and he had to go back and, and begin clearing out the house and, and so mm-hmm. forth. And then being the writer, I, I started going to dark places and wondering, like, you know, you go back to, to clear out your old family house and what if you find something there that that changes everything about um who you thought your father or your mother was and so that was kind of the, the starting point i just had this this image of of somebody clearing out a room and, and finding a photograph of something awful and in this case it's you know a, a photo of a dead person right um and just kind of that that challenge of of trying to re-understand or investigate the past that you thought you knew. Um, and so that was, that was kind of the starting point of this book. And then obviously any, any time you write something, it, it begins evolving and, and changing and, and so forth. And how much, um, I feel like there's, of course, you know, a lot of Hamlet uh, references. I don't know if that was super intentional or not with the characters, names of Ophelia and even Holt, you know, with the age. And then we also have the, the mother issues and the sort of sins of the family. Like how much, I wouldn't exactly say it's like a Shakespearean adaptation necessarily, but I did feel a lot of Shakespearean themes. Was that intentional or did that just sort of like come as you were writing? There was definitely some of that. I, you know, it's it's as a writer, I think, Shakespeare almost comes naturally into of course, most he's a things he's you're going to write. It's, yeah. Um, funny enough, the, the name Ophelia, I, I grew up with somebody, her name was Ophelia and I just really oh. liked the name. And it it's was a cool just, name. I, yeah. Yeah. I've always thought it was just kind of like a, a haunting name and, and the fact that it, that it goes well with, you know, with, with Hamlet and some of those things is nice too. Um, but yeah, I, I, I try not to, I try not to be too heavy handed in, in, you know, that kind of, it, that kind of symbolism, but it's always funny. Like after you write a book, when, when people start telling you the things that they, you, they notice and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to do. Right. You're like, sure. Yeah. Create yeah. your own meaning. And then it made that, but that's what good work does is, you know, it's not just, there's one meaning there can be sort of multiple meanings and you can pull bits and pieces from different mm-hmm. things. Um, and then how much of that also came into play in terms of like the, the water imagery and motifs and the baptism, was that sort of related to Hamlet at all too, or was that sort of just like a separate idea that kind of flowed? That, that was a separate idea, but that was certainly kind of, you know, certainly the biggest part of the novel, um, you know, thus the name beneath cruel waters, right. but you know, there, there's so many different, well, I mean, throughout literature, but it's also just a powerful piece of symbolism is, is the baptism, um, taking away your sins, but also, right. you know, you can, you can drown in the water and uh, there, there's a sense of danger in the water. And so, um, you know, the, the, the book deals a lot with, with religiosity and, and with what happens when, 
you know, I, I didn't want this book to be a, a book bashing religion. That's definitely not what it no, was no, no, intended no. to be at all. Um, but it, it does deal with with what happens when you kind of have blind faith or you become right. Or one uh, person takes the concept of that religion and sort of twists it to meet their own, you know, clearly has some other mental issues going on. And then they use religion as like a tool, but it's not like a cult leader was like instilling these ideas or anything like that. No, yeah, any sense. yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and then I just think, you know, just from a, a visual standpoint that, that the image of being dunked underwater is, is kind of a powerful one. It goes back to like uh, so, the witch trials too, you know, like if she floats, she's not, a, or was it, she sinks, she's not a witch, but then she drowns anyways, or right. something like that, you know, or you go back to the Bible literally. And there's all those, you know, river Jordan and all the water metaphors. I'm going to take a wild guess. Are you a particularly religious person? Uh, I, I'm not a religious I was gonna person. Say, I, was gonna, I didn't want to assume, but you didn't. So, you know, how much of that was like research based? Did you do a lot of like anecdotal research or was it more sort of just like your own interpretations of things that you've seen in the past? Like how much of the religiosity came into uh, preparedness did you do, I guess? Um, you know, I was actually, I'm, I'm Jewish. Uh, Me but, too. Part of the tribe. Okay. Nice. So Te- I, uh, I mean, technically, I really don't. I haven't been to yeah. temple in a long time. Same, same. Thing. I, I, I didn't, I didn't practice at all growing up. My, my parents were very secular. There was really, so it was just by, just by name, really. Um, but when I was in high school, I started you know, being around. There was a girl I dated, and some of my friends were very, very religious, and I just became kind of fascinated in, in a lot of that stuff. And um, in college, I actually majored in religion. Oh, okay. um, Again, not because I was religious, but just because I was I was really fascinated. No, with, theology is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. With religion itself. So um, so it's something that I've always had a lot of kind of background knowledge on. Um, so I didn't have to do a, a ton of, of research. And and I had a lot of people in high school and in college kind of trying to trying to convert me and, and taking <laughs> me to to their churches and, and doing a lot of hallelujahs. And, um, was it because you were kind of like this blank slate that they felt that they could mold because you were like, eh, whatever religion they're like, Oh, let me show you my religion and show you why it's the best one. I think there was, there was definitely a piece of that. One of the weirdest experience I had as I was in college and, um, I went to talk to professor about a grade, which was a mistake. Uh, (laughs) It's, and he wasn't, he wasn't a religious, a religion teacher. I don't think uh, maybe he was. I don't think he was. I think he was like uh, English or something like that. Um, and then he, we started somehow talking about religion. And then he asked me if I would pray with him. And it was really, uh, it, was, it was awkward. It was, it was odd, you know, yeah. and um, it's very and, intimate. And it's, if you don't prescribe to that intimacy as well, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and my, my wife is, is religious, but I really like, she's, you know, it's not in any kind of the, the judgmental way. And it's right. very much about community and inclusion and, and all that stuff. But um, but it's amazing, you know, in 21st century, how much it, it still permeates everything around yeah. us. And 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 using religion can can also be, just be used as as metaphorical, as you talked about before, of, of having a, a need for something, whether it's religion or something else. And, and what happens when that need um, becomes so great that it, that, that it kind of overwhelms everything else. And then, you know, leads to psychological trauma is why I don't, I don't want to give away if anyone hasn't read the book, but I think, you know, that idea also of burying things and using religion as sort of a coping mechanism, but it's not really getting, you know, using it as sort of a solve all when it's really not, especially if you're not approaching it in the best way possible. I mean, I, you hear all the stories of people, they say, you know, I was a heroin addict and religion saved my life. And now, you know, Jesus saved me. And so it does like work, you know, some people it works, but then there's other people that you hear, you know, there's West Baptist church and all this crazy, you know, crazy yeah. other it's religion, you know, you majored in it. So you could, you could talk about it all day. Um, Speaking of the the intertwining and the intertwining stories and time periods, how much of your plot and specifically do you kind of plan in advance and how much do you sort of let it take you on its journey? And then going along with that, was it a conscious decision to include the intertwining time periods? Yeah, it was a conscious decision. So the book for people who haven't read it or thinking about reading it, it kind of goes back and forth in time between 1984 and the pretty much contemporary time, the present time. Um, I, I'm somebody I, I have to kind of plan, at least the plot wise, I sort of have to plan everything out beforehand. Uh, otherwise, I just, I, I start panicking that it's going to totally go off the rail. So so I have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. But 
I always leave enough room for some surprises as as I'm writing. And so what will usually happen is that the general plot will be kind of the way that I had it uh-huh. initially, but there'll be characters that kind that appear in in different ways than I thought they were going to appear. And they might be characters I didn't even know existed before I started writing it who will appear and become major characters, or there'll be more minor characters who play a big role in, in the text. Um, and then this one, you know, I, I worked with a really great editorial team at the, the publishers called Blackstone Publishing. And um, it's always kind of interesting to, to see somebody else who, who understands your work, but also has a different perspective. And so, um, you know, some of the, if you read the book the way it was initially, there's definitely a shift in, in the way the book ends up, the, the final product. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, so it's kind of, it, it's all those things. Like there, there's definitely, um, you know, it wasn't something that I just started writing and, and just to see what happened. It was, it was, I definitely kind of have a linear view of the way that the book that's is going go, to be. Yeah. Um, the thing, you know, the thing that's challenging about, I guess, any book, but this book in particular is you have all these things that some characters know and some characters don't know. Right. And so it's keeping track of who knows what, when, and then also how much to reveal to, to your audience, you know? And so there's the, there is that balance of, I've got to keep some of my characters in the dark. I've got to keep some of my audience in the dark, but I've also got to give enough information to my characters and enough information to my audience that, that right. they don't get too angry. Yeah, that was my next question is I feel like you weave in twists really beautifully without it being this sort of like deus ex machina that comes out of nowhere. Like everything does seem intentional and some things you can kind of guess along as the you know reader or the audience and other things are kind of like, oh, I didn't see that coming, but then it makes you rethink of other things. And so do you feel like you differentiate between surprise and suspense? Because I know that those can sometimes be synonymous words for a lot of people, but for other people, they can be different. So like, how do you really focus on what to give to your audience and what to sort of hold back and spool out slowly. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest challenge. I think the biggest art is just what you said. Um, I, I kind of consciously in this one avoided doing just the, as you said, just like the crazy shock. And I, right. I love, I mean, I, I it works you know, sometimes, of course. Yeah. It's when, not you're, a, yeah. when you're totally shocked, I remember seeing Sixth Sense in the movie theater, for example. Oh, yeah. Like that kind of thing is like, it's hard, always, like fight I've club. Always, yeah. I've always wanted to do that. And, and, but I also know that it can sometimes ring a little phony and it can be uh-huh. a little bit cheap at times if it's not done really well. So so for this one, it was a little less of it was. Yeah, I think if you read it, there's going to be surprises. There's going to be twists. Some of them, as you said, some of them you will kind of maybe guess as, as you're reading along. Some of them are more surprising. Um, and, and my aim wasn't just to, you know, to like completely pull the rug out from you all right. the time. Uh, but I think there, you know, there might be one or two rugs that are that are pulled out a little bit. But it's <laughs> mini but the rugs, hope is, yeah. yeah. But the hope is that it's that it's not done too cheaply. That it's done that it's done honestly and, and in a way that people can connect to emotionally, as opposed to just wow, what a what a crazy twist. No, I definitely think, and that's for for all your books. I'm sorry, I haven't read all nine of them, but I can confess that the few I have read, I think that's what really makes you a great horror writer because especially or horror writer, you know, thriller, dark writer. And see, I'm pitching a hole in you because that's how I first found you is I think I was even like looking up like horror authors. And we talked about The Lantern Man before we started recording, which I think that one is probably more a little traditionally like horror, Mm -hmm. um, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, But speak, you know, how do you find that the, the genre itself Self, you know, horror, thriller, whatever, like, does the community support you? I know that you're probably friends with some other authors and how does it work in terms of like, because it can be easy to fall into these traps and these sort of like mass market, like formulaic things. Whereas I think you're a lot more artistic, like how do you, how do you benefit from the larger literary community and how does that play a work in your, or play a role in your work? Yeah. I mean, it's a, for the most part, it's a pretty supportive community. Um, and again, so I don't I don't feel like I'm a, uh, necessarily a part of, of just that horror group or you know, when I first started, I, I think I geared a little bit more towards crime fiction, but I never really fit there either. It's kind of like being in school where you're you're trying to right. find your little gang. But instead, it's been more just kind of individual writers as opposed to mm-hmm. a, a particular community. There's been, you know, some a guy like Paul Trembley, who's become a I just really- read the Paul Bears Club last night, actually. Oh, how is it? I haven't. I liked it a lot. Talk about playing with like narrative and memoir. That's why I really like his books. And this one I liked a lot. They liked it. It was good. Yeah. And so sometimes you get these guys who are, you know, he's obviously become huge, but he's such a kind, like generous. He's also person. a teacher, right? 
I think he, yeah, he teaches math and um oh my god what wait i had no idea that's fascinating <laughs> yeah exactly i don't i don't know how those two types of reasoning go usually people are like one you can't be a successful author and a math teacher like that's too much that's crazy yeah so i'll have these you know sometimes these these big name authors there's uh uh craig johnson who wrote all the longmire the, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. the longmire novels is we had the same french publisher and and he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and, and was just, again, really generous with, with his time and with kind of promoting me and so forth. And then, you know, the hope is that as I can, as I get kind of a bigger audience moving forward, that I can do the same thing for, for other authors too. And I think that kind of paying it for is, is beneficial for, for everybody. And, um, you know, you're, you're going to find some just like any, community there's going to be some of the the backstabbing and the and the yeah. gossiping and and there's definitely been those times I and mean, the, the worst feeling in the world is the feeling of jealousy uh, of where like you know why is this person so much more successful than me and, and my you book probably read better. their book yeah you read their book and you're like wait my book was better like why is yeah. there's a new york and times it's bestseller a, it's crazy it's an all it's an awful selfish feeling but you know i get it and probably most writers do and and um and when I do that, I have to kind of pull back and maybe get off of social media for for a little while. Yeah. But there are but there's so many just great people in the community as long as you kind of know where to look, I guess. And so, can you talk a little bit more about the specific publishing process and you know your your ups and downs? You've worked with different publishers, I think, from some of your different books. Um, so, what have you learned with working with bigger versus smaller? You know, we don't need a whole diatribe in publishing, but sort of just, you know, what it would have been the ups and downs of working with different publishers and working with different various forms of getting your book out into the world. Yeah. You know, most of my American books, the, the first eight were with very small publishers, kind of mom and pop type publishers. And, you know, the, the nice thing about that is you do have so much control over your work. It's, it's pretty much you, if they like it, that's the way it's going to be. You that's know? Awesome. And, yeah. and, um, so, so, you know, some of the things that I've written that maybe wouldn't have gotten published in some of, in some of the bigger publishers, mainstream publishers, I, I got to get out there. Um, there's also an advantage, um, like my publisher now, Blackstone, it's still an independent publisher, but they're a pretty, you know, much bigger publisher right. and they have a, a much bigger kind of national profile and so forth. And, and the advantages obviously are, you know, things like the book gets into Barnes and Nobles and, and that kind of stuff. And that's a big kick to walk into those stores. That and, must and be theater. so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, having a, an editorial team and, and a marketing team and, and all of that, it does make your book better. You know, you sometimes as an author, you, you think you write, well, this is what, what's finished is, is my masterpiece and it shouldn't be touched. But, but there's a lot of people who know a lot about writing and know a lot about the audiences who, who can make things a lot better. And I know the book, Beneath Crow Waters is a lot better now than it was when I first gave huh. it to them. Um, so that's a big, big advantage. Um, you know, I've had the books published in in France and Germany, and that's been a totally different scene as well, just because especially France, it's just such a different audience. They're so much more enamored with books than we are here. And so <laughs> in Europe you know, in like, general, I feel like for the most part, it's just more like lit friendly than America. Yeah, it was it was really wild. I, you know, so I got to go out there and again, I'm like very minor author out there, but I was an author and you feel like kind of a rock star out there, you know, yeah, it's like it doesn't, you, you are an artist, like you are a creator and people don't appreciate that. They are like, Oh, an, an author is just as valued as like a singer or something. People don't put them on the same level. Yeah. So you, you come back here and you kind of go back to, to that. And that was, a, that was a little depressing, but, <laughs> um, but it's, I I've, enjoyed working with each one of my publishers. I've had, I've had good experiences with all of them. I I've been fortunate not to have any total nightmarish experiences okay. with publishers. I, you know, I had a cup I won't get into, yeah, but, you don't need but nothing, <laughs> but nothing too terrible. And I've, I've really, really loved working with, with Blackstone on this one. And, and hopefully, you know, I've got another one finished. Hopefully they'll take that one on as well. So we'll see. Oh, awesome. So you have to sort of pitch each one individually, but now that you have this relationship with them, hopefully you'll continue to work with them in the future. Yeah, it helps. It helps. They, you know, they were pretty clear. They said, well, we, we need to see your sales. We need to see how your yeah, sales yeah. are before we decide on, on the next one. But, um, but yeah, having, having, you know, having the relationship just like in any industry or any business right. helps a lot for sure. 
Um, can you talk a little bit more about the importance of setting this book specifically in Colorado, as well as your own personal connections to place and how that plays out in your novels? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've lived in a town called Longmont, Colorado for the last, oh geez, about 18 years. I, I grew up in Colorado. I grew up in Boulder okay. um, and I was, I was gone for, for college in the Midwest. And then I moved out to the West coast in Oregon. And then I, I lived in New York city for about four years and just kind of moved back around and ended up settling back close to my hometown. And in a lot of ways, this book is, is sort of a fictionalized version of Longmont, but you know, the great thing about fiction is that you're able, well, you can able control it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, it, there, there's certain name drops of, of specific places there in Longmont, but, but I kind of moved it farther East uh, out on the plains a little bit and, you know, having it, a lot of it take place in the 1980s made a difference as well. Uh, but I've, I've, as kind of a, again, pigeonholes, whatever I am, dark fiction or a, yes. a noir writer or whatever you want to say, I, I've always thought that having books that take place where there's a lot of space and there's a lot of mm. emptiness uh, makes it easier to give that sense of of loneliness, you know, because yeah. there is there is a, a disconnect. And if you have a, a disconnect with and this isn't like prerogative term or or you know, saying it's a, it's a bad thing out in Eastern Colorado, but there is a lot of space and there's a lot of yeah. emptiness and, and, and you can see how that loneliness would, would manifest itself. So, um, yeah. So the, the sense of place is a character in the book yeah. for sure. It's, it's something that kind of governs the way people live and and the way people view each other. And, and, uh, and it's a good place to be able to dump bodies, you know? Right. Exactly. I mean, that's what's always like, I am pretty much a city. I grew up in cities for the most part. I lived in Burlington, Vermont when I went to college. So that was like the closest I got to rural, but even there, it was kind of like, they didn't have a target in the entire state. And that just felt like we, like when you have these creature comforts of growing up in cities and then you have, instead it's like, you got to drive 20 minutes to the nearest gas station. Or there was a kid in who I met who had never been to a restaurant because he lived in such a small town. It was like pretty, pretty wild how these little yeah. communities and we forget but also because Colorado also I feel like I think of it as like okay Boulder and Denver and I forget too that there's a lot of these like larger rural areas and that's true of most states I think yeah, so totally. it's cool I to mean, explore those spaces yeah most people with Colorado yeah you think of Denver but you also think of the mountains you know and skiing and all that and that's, and that's true and there's a lot of land that goes with that and but you know half the state is out in is out in the plains where there's really just just nothing and you can you can drive for 50 miles, 60 miles and, and see nothing. And, um, and there is, there is kind of a quiet beauty to it as well. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, my writing, I, I attempt and sometimes succeed, sometimes don't in trying to get kind of that, that lyrical feeling of, of place. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of lyricism out in yes. Eastern Colorado. Um, you know, a little more philosophical here. Um, do you think we can change the past and is it wise to Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. I think uh, it was either in one of my books or another book I read that I stole um, of, you know, like the, the past is always changing, right? And Because our perception um, of it is changing and the stimuli that we are experiencing in our present constantly shapes our perception of the past. It's yeah, that's why I, remember, I love multi-timeline. It's just a lot. It's yeah, crazy to think about. Reading something about every single time you remember something the memory is changing because of where yeah. you are at that particular That's moment true. in your life. So yeah, I do think, I do think the past changes. I think we do change the past and, and I, I think we're always in a lot of ways, we're always trying to, we're trying to manipulate our past and, and manipulate our narrative to, to fit our needs at that particular time. And, um, you know, one of the, the hardest things and things that I've, that I've dealt with and probably most people have is, is, is being haunted by your past. Yeah. And so in some ways, this book is about um, kind of recognizing that past, uh, trying to understand the past and trying to forgive yourself for mm. the past. And that, that last so one. So much easier said than done. Yeah, I was going to say that last one is, is the most difficult one of being able because because we all mess up. Right. And, you know, some of us mess up more than others, but but being able to to be compassionate towards ourselves and, and our former selves, I think is, is a good way to heal. 
And is that why you sort of decide to write these with more of an omniscient, that these are the book specifically have more of like an omniscient third person narration versus more of like a first person narrate narration that maybe would have been, you know, it allows for sort of that fragmentation and sort of, you know, like I said, omniscient look at what's going on in the different timelines versus having it be narrated from a first person might be a little too like unreliable narrator. Yeah, I've always loved doing the first person unreliable. And, and, and since I'm always interested in memory, first person unreliable narrators is a pretty cool thing to try. But yeah, but this one was this one was different. And, and you're right, it kind of shifts from you know, the beginning, it's completely omniscient. And then there's uh, a lot of third person limited from different characters point of views as it kind of as it kind of moves around. And again, it was one of those those you know, a lot of the choice in in the narrative for this book was about the audience, about what I could reveal right. and what I couldn't reveal. And so there were there were certain times where it was okay to get into the head of, of Ophelia and it was okay to get into the head of Vivian. And there's other times where I didn't want the audience to know what was going on with them. And so so it, it's that balance. And again, without without being cheap and without cheating and so forth is is what I tried to do. But um, writing in third person does give you a little bit more freedom, you right. know, being able to move in space and time and character. Um, it takes away a little bit of, of the intimacy of, of first person. And so it's always a little bit of that, that give and take. And yeah, like uh, of my first five or so novels, I think almost all of them were written in first person, but I've kind of over the it's last. A little cha- it's a little more challenging too, because you yourself have to be a little more unbiased and really think about it from the audience's point of view, more than just the character's point of view. So that's, you know, it's not easy to do that decision. Yeah. I, I think um, I always tell my students, like if they're struggling with their writing, that the first person is, is a more natural way to write totally. you know, because, because we're used to telling stories and we tell stories right. in first person. Um, third person is a, little, is a little less natural, but yeah, it does. It, it forces, I think you're right. It, it forces you to, um, to understand a lot of different perspectives and it under, and it forces you to understand the big picture a little bit more when you're writing in first person. Um, the main character doesn't really need to understand the big picture right. because the first person is living in that, in that kind of narrow perspective. And just the way that you frame the story too, as well, like you could have a first person narration where it's like nothing really happens, but you're getting this fascinating, like, I don't know, sometimes it's harder when it's more of like a stream of consciousness thing, if it's omniscient, but it has to be done well, it's all, uh, you know, it's a delicate balance. Um, <laughs> speaking of stories and the big picture, have you ever considered writing a screenplay, written a screenplay? Have you ever, you know, dabbled with other writing forms beyond just uh, fiction? Yeah, I've um, I've been a little bit in this whole movie thing for the last few years, kind of in that pre-production hell that you that you hear about. Uh, yeah, that's why I didn't want to be a screen screenwriter because it's a lot. Yeah, um, it was actually it was, I, I think it might have been Paul Tremble or somebody else was talking about the difference between publishing and movies. And in publishing, it's it's no 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 until yes, and in movies, it's yes 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 until no. And mm, yeah. that's what I've experienced a lot of. I've, so I've had several of my books have been optioned for for films, about four of them. And and there were so many times where, you know, this is going to happen. You know, we've we've got this actor right. and we've got this financing and this is going to happen. And then I get excited. And oh, by the way, it's not going to happen. Um, but then I've you written, see another horror movie that comes out and you're like, how the hell? Or sorry, I keep <laughs> pigeonholing you, pigeonholing you into horror. And that's so much. If you see another noir movie that comes out and you're like, what the hell? Like, how did this get made? And mine, it's well, the same thing. A, I, I don't know how, know how any movie gets made, honestly. Like just being a part of this, there's just so, there's just so many variables that have to, have to come together. So yeah, I have written a couple screenplays. They've been, um, adaptations of my own books, just the, you know, directors or producers are requested that I do it. And, um, a couple of them are still kind of out there and are okay. being, you know, like so we have, not all hope is lost. We might see one not here. All hope is, not all hope is lost. There's still some possibilities. I, I've been working with a director named Ivan Kavanaugh, who's he's an Irish director who's who did some horror movies. Um, and he's a super cool guy and we've really connected. And so we worked on a script together recently. And um, so, you know, it's obviously it's a it's a different as you you know, as a as a 
recovering screenwriter. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, they're just like form. shoved away and, and that I don't, I don't have even looked at them in quite a while. Cause I'm like, so embarrassed talk about revisiting the past and memories. I'm like, that's going to open up a whole can of worms. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to try. No, 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 no. You're all, <laughs> um, no, I love, I, I love dark things as well. So that's why I mean, nothing really just, body horror is the one thing that really makes me uncomfortable or like really visceral. Like I can handle murder. I can handle like sexual assault and all that stuff. But if you're talking about like the nails getting ripped off or like you're showing me a really visceral, like brain, like, I don't like that. Yeah. I, I same here. I do a lot of eye covering in those scenes. So. Yeah. Or I'm just, I'm like, I look, or like there's some book and it's really hard to do that on the page. I think to make someone feel this really uncomfortable, at least me, who's like, I could really read a lot and feel like, Oh, that was messed up or whatever. But like, I don't feel it, but there was, I forget the book, but it was about like a Spanish, it was a Spanish author and it was translated. And it was about like cannibalism as like a futuristic society where people were eating each other, but like not in a sort of like gauche way it was sort of kind of like fight club in this like capitalistic yeah. post but it was the way that they talked about the human flesh and everything it's just so that's why i really love when people are psychological because then you can still scare people you can still be like oh makes me revisit things um well we are running short on time so i'll just i'll ask you one more question because i know you got a lot of well it's your summer break but i know you got a lot of stuff to do um what is your own worst nightmare situation and how do you think you would react when faced with it mm. For me, um, it has to do with mental health. You know, it has to do with, um, I mean, I, I've dealt with my own, with, you know, as, as a lot of people have, but I've dealt with my own kind of mental health issues, depression, Which gives anxiety. you such a good perspective. I mean, it's like the best people, you know, it's cliche maybe, but you got to go through your own struggles to really be able to write them well. Yeah. But I think going through kind of that, that extreme extreme depression, um, going into to paranoia where you begin to lose a sense of, of mm -hmm. reality and begin to lose a sense of your own perceptions. And for me, that would be the biggest nightmare. And, and most of the movies and books that scare me the most, you, I mean, you talked about psychological horror. It's, it's for me, it's literally psychological. Yeah, horror. I guess well, this can be our real last question. What are some of your, you know, classic, what are some of your favorite psychological horror movies? What really like scares you? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the cliche would be The Shining. I did love The Shining. The Shining. One of my my yes. favorite movies. Um, another movie that I absolutely loved, which is sort of horror, is I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called Angel Heart from the. No, 90s. I haven't. Okay, but I'll have to add it. So I'm going to write it down. Yeah, yeah. And it's an '80s movie, you said too. It's '80s. It's oh, with I love Mickey, that. Mickey Rourke and Robert De Niro. Angel Heart. I haven't heard about it. It, I love doesn't, it. it doesn't come across as like a an eighties horror movie. It's it's very stylish and, and beautiful. Oh, perfect. Um, you know, it's, it's no Sleepaway Camp or Nightmare on Elm Street. No, no, one of those. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, you'll, you'll have you'll, to check that out. It's sort of like well, yeah, I won't say anything more, but that's one of my favorite movies too. And oh, okay, yeah, that's so why I'll leave it at those two. Okay, awesome. Those are some those are some good picks. Are you a big Kubrick guy in general, or you just really like The Shining? Um. I like The Shining. I mean, I like, I, you know, I like a lot no, I'm of the same, movies. I'm the same way too. I'm like, I, I, I like Clockwork Orange a lot too, but I think Shining is really just. Yeah. I mean, he's very, he's very, place. not to get in standing, but he's, he's very cold, but I thought, you know, The Shining is beautiful and, and dark and. So, Isn't that yeah. interesting too? how like there are certain horror movies that can make you feel like so like I personally love Silence of the Lambs. Like I know it can freak a lot of people out, but I watch it. I'm like, oh, this is kind of a comforting movie. Like I have a death said okay. moth right here. I have one tattooed on me. I like I love it's kind of messed up when you think about the the moths in the context of the film. But I kind of love the idea of transformation and the beauty of all that. And Clarice Starling is a hero. And Anthony really? Hopkins, Hannibal is a key, just this harmless little man serial killer. <laughs> that's what people think I'm, you know, that's that it's like those people who think you're weird. It's like, I could watch horror movies all day. No problem. But I'm, the news, that's, that's a whole other horror story that I'm like avoiding. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, John. Um, we will link your book below. We'll make, we'll link your social media and everything. Um, I'm sure we'll stay in touch on Twitter and all that jazz. Um, and until next time, everyone stay reading. Mm -hmm.